Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle, and I am the foster mentor for whelping. So that's um, from pregnant dogs through to labor delivery and then the litters after and then sometimes with the litters. Um, and because of this weekend, I'm helping Sarah out by creating this video so that you can watch it and um, at your leisure and be ready to take on a foster hopefully this weekend. So um, first I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for getting on board. We are so, so excited to have you here. Um, it's going to be an incredible weekend and I am just very excited to have you on board. And so um, yeah, so anyway, let's get started. This is just going to be, I'm going to share my screen with you. It's going to be a presentation. And then, um, and I will hopefully be able to get to all of your questions as we go through it. So, all right, great. So, welcome to the orientation. Here we are. Hi all, my name is Michelle and I'm the Whelping Foster Mentor for Coco's Heart and I am here just to kind of help out the foster coordinator create this video so that um, you're, you can get onboarded and be able to start right away, um, be able to watch the video at your leisure and still be able to answer some of the questions that you might be having about being able to be a foster and so they feel really good. So thank you for being here, we're excited and I'm happy to be helping. So just a few objectives about the orientation where we would normally in this part go around and do some introductions, but because we're doing a video for this circumstance, we won't obviously be doing that unless if you want to introduce yourself to yourself. Um, but a little bit about me, I am the whelping foster mentor, as I mentioned earlier, which just really means if you don't know what whelping means, it just means that I foster dogs and I help people who are fostering dogs who are pregnant through labor, delivery, and then the puppies after they've been born. Um, and then sometimes I assist with litters as well, just because it's kind of its own unique fostering experience. And so if that's something that you're interested in, please, please, please let me know. Um, I'm always excited to be able to bring more people on board and it helps us be able to save more pregnant moms and her pups um, in the rescue. So let me know. Um, so yeah, so um, we'll talk a little bit about the background of Coco's Heart Dog Rescue and who's who for the staff team. And then with the actual orientation, we'll talk about bringing your first dog home, um, detailing kind of common medical or behavior concerns that you might experience, tips and recommendations for moving forward with that, um, foster failing, that's what we call it when you actually adopt the dog that you are fostering and it's just to kind of, it, it's just kind of a joke because you fail at your job of fostering them and fostering is supposed to be just temporary. But anyway, so that's what that means. And then just a little bit about process and procedures. And then typically we would answer any questions that you would have. But in this circumstance, if you just want to email any questions that you have to your foster mentor, then your foster mentor can answer those or forward them on to somebody who would be able to answer them for you. So a little bit about who's who um, and Coco's Heart. So Coco's Heart um, is an organization that was created and dedicated to Ashley's beloved dog that passed away um, when she was just 12 years old. And so um, she knew that she wanted to do more with the with the lives of dogs in the world. And so decided to create a organization to be able to help and has really, really grown tremendously in the last number of years. Um, in 2010 is when the dream really became a reality and it became a 501c nonprofit organization and recognize, recognized by the state of Wisconsin. Um, we operate with uh, hundreds of volunteers. Um, I just was looking today and we have over 600 fosters on our team, which is incredible. Um, and that's not even including all the volunteers that help with transport or um, get supplies or do home visits, things like that. 
Um, we are a foster based rescue. We don't have um, any real boarding options. We aren't a pound or humane society in that way. We really, really rely on you all to be able to give these dogs loving and caring homes so that they can have somewhere warm to live and have the food and nourishment that they need, be able to get a bath when they need it as well. Um, because we really, really believe that being able to see a dog in its true form really requires them to be in a home environment and we want to make sure that adoptions are as successful as possible and really the only way that we're able to do that is by having the dogs be in home so that you can learn behaviors and you can help train them and be able to pass on that information to prospective adopters so that they can decide if they'd like to move forward with the adoption or not. Um, we also provide very high quality veterinary care. That's something that's really, really important to Ashley and the rescue as a whole is that we are providing the best veterinary care possible. And so we've really done a lot to be able to make sure that we're doing that. We've um, also recently gotten on veterinary care within rescue, which is incredible. Um, and as we move forward in the next number of months, we'll be able to move that into being um, more permanent and more every day, every single thing will go through hopefully that veterinary care. Um, but at least for right now, while we're in the interim, we're utilizing it as much as possible, uh, which is great. And then, um, like we, I said earlier, the adoption process is striving to make sure that the dogs are placed in their forever homes. And we truly try to do as much as we can to do that. And the first step is finding foster homes that they can be able to live in. We can learn more about the dog, find a good, a good match for them, and then be able to um, really support them kind of after adoption as well. And I still cannot believe that rescue, um, that Coco's Heart has rescued over 11,000 animals and found their forever homes. That's incredible. So, um, here's a little bit about the kind of the fostering org chart. So there's a couple of other people that are involved with the rescue in a variety of capacities, but for what you, for kind of for your purposes, the director and founder of the organization is Ashley. Um, and then there's a daily operations manager and adoptions coordinator. She works very closely, um, that's Johanna, and she works very closely with Ashley, but also in conjunction with the foster coordinator, Sarah, who um, really kind of oversees all of us foster mentors, and then in turn, the foster mentors oversee all of you. And so that's kind of what the chain looks like. Um, they really function as a team, and we as foster mentors really function as a team as well. And so um, that's the best way that we can provide the most care to all of you all and to our dogs as well. So if you have questions about things, it's best to just email your foster mentors. If it's something adoption related, you can include Johanna on that email. Um, and then oftentimes Sarah likes being looped in on those emails as well. So you can email foster at if you have questions or if you're interested in a particular foster, that's a great um, option as well. Um, so a little bit about the other coordinators and people involved. Erica is our administrative coordinator. She does the Instagram account. She does merchandising, a ton of the graphics work. She does a ton of behind the scenes stuff, um, paperwork, things like that. Uh, Molly is our fundraiser and events and showcases person. So she does all of the events, anything from you want to bring a dog to an adoption event. Awesome. She's your person. There might be an impromptu thing, something that's you know, ongoing every year, some is ongoing every week. She really handles all of that. Uh, Julie is our transport intakes and supplies coordinator. So if you need any supplies for the, um, for your foster dog, you'll want to connect with her. And, um, and then she also works with all of our transport. So anytime that there's an intake, she'll be able to help with that. And then Anne does our welcome, or our thank yous, excuse me. Um, and so she's, great there too. And then Cassie works with microchips and then other volunteers as well. Um, so that's awesome. And then Jocelyn assists Julie with the transport pieces as well. And then Larissa is a dog advocate for so showcases. So you might see Wolfing around with Larissa. She is working with 
our events coordinator and our admin coordinator to be able to make sure that we can get out the word out into the public about kind of what events are going on. So bringing your dog home. So the locations for transports can vary, but right now we're really officing out of Angel's Pet World in Hudson. Um, that will also be where, um, where the intake veterinary care for this intake will happen. So um, the plan is to have first vaccinations completed, um, brucellosis testing, um, ultrasounds, things like that. Some of like the basic care that you would need to be able to bring your dog into the home that would be all completed. We provide collars and leashes. We do a two point of contact for safety. So you'll want to make sure that the dog has um, a, a martingale collar. So one with a double loop system. And we can show you about that as well, or you can look it up online. Um, but using that with a regular clip leash as well as a slip lead. Some of our dogs come from high flight risk backgrounds. Our breeder dogs are one of them. Um, our dogs from the reservations and our shelter dogs aren't as high risk, but we still wanna be as careful as possible. But those breeder dogs, where they're petrified of people oftentimes. And so making sure that we have as much safety measures and in process is important. So that's something. Um, house and home boundaries. Your foster dog should earn their freedom. So I, I usually, when I welcome in a dog, will have it have a like a leash that I'm holding until I feel like it's comfortable introducing them one dog at a time. I have a lot of dogs in my house. Um, obviously as a mentor, I <laughs> take on probably more than the average foster does. And so I have a lot of dogs in my house. And so I wanna make sure that I'm doing the intro slowly and properly. And so I start with my dogs that I know are rock solid and that I know my dogs get along with everybody. And sometimes I utilize one of my resident dogs versus the other based on what I've observed of the foster dog that I'm bringing in. Um, I try to use my outside in my backyard as much as possible. Leashes are great for being able to have controlled environments. Sometimes I use crates, like having my dog in a crate and letting the foster dog walk around the crate because I know that my dogs are calm in their crates. Things like that can be really, really great. Um, and then, like I said, having um, leashes for those. And then I usually have a dropped leash. Um, so having a leash on the dog, the new foster dog, and having it dropped um, for usually the first day or two um, until I really feel confident that the dog is comfortable in my environment, at least to the point where I am not terribly concerned about them responding negatively towards a dog or a human. Um, and, um, but really all of our dogs in rescue should be dog friendly. Um, that's kind of a requirement of our rescue. And so that's something that, but that does not mean that we shouldn't be careful. So just wanna make sure that we know that. Um, and then food transitioning. So food quality is really important to us. We pretty much always use Nutrisource um, dog or puppy food. And so making sure that we do that is important. And then um, we also, will provide adopters with, excuse me, some of that food so they can transition properly onto whatever type of food that they're interested in. And all of that food gets donated to, um, and is available at Angel's Pet World in Hudson um, as of this point. I don't know if that will change once we get into the building, but at least as of this point, you can plan on that and then look for communication as we move into the new space to see if that's gonna be different. Um, but yeah, consistency with family members is extremely important. Making sure that you're having your children be respectful of dogs is crucial. Um, I often, I too many times see with adopters especially, will um, see that parents don't have appropriate boundaries for their children with the dogs, especially for some of our dogs that just are not used to being, you know, laid on top of. Um, and so really making sure that your children understand, okay, this is not a toy for you to play with. This is a dog for us to um, show love and compassion to um, is going to be really important. And so just making sure that you're being diligent about that as well, um, just for the safety of the dog um, and your children. And then introducing to cats, we have lots of fosters within rescue. I'm not one of them, but we do have lots that have cats and will have 
there's some great videos on our Facebook page that show how to introduce to a dog or excuse me, a cat properly. And so that's something to be considerate of. The thing that's nice about cats is that typically they can um, maneuver around a little bit differently than um, dogs can, <laughs> getting up onto certain places, moving a little bit quicker, getting into small spaces. Um, and so sometimes that introduction just is like that. Um, and then we will um, send home ID tags, Coco's Heart ID tags, and Home Again tags when it's possible. Sometimes they are microchipped at intake, sometimes they are microchipped before, and sometimes they are microchipped at the veterinary care facilities. But regardless of when they are microchipped, they will be microchipped before adoption. That's one thing that we always do. And so um, you may get that information and you want to send that home with the adopter. The ID tag that you get from Coco's, the Coco's one, you'll want to make sure that you get that back with the collar and leash um, at adoption. So transports and intakes. Um, so one of the things that you'll want to do is um, solidify any arrangement if you're unable to pick up the dog from intake. So we usually will find out, you know, a day or two or a few days before a roughly when intake is going to happen and then the day of intake will know approximate time. Some things are important to be aware of is that ETAs can change um, throughout the evening just depending on if there's traffic or if there's an accident on the freeway or um, you know something like that or if the pass off between vehicles because we oftentimes do several legs of intakes. Uh, or for transports, it, sometimes that will get delayed. Sometimes just intaking them takes a little bit longer than expected. But if you are unable to take a dog at the time that it's that you have signed up to take a dog, then you need to let us know so that we can find a temporary placement for you. Um, but know that temporary placements are an option almost always. And so if you can be a temporary foster for a dog, that's great um, and to let Sarah know. Um, and if you need a temporary foster, then that's something to let us know about as well. So intake procedures, you'll arrive into the parking lot. At this point, it will be angels. You'll arrive to that parking lot. Um, you'll want to arrive early so that we can get you the supplies that are need, needed. Um, wait in your car or next to your car. It is important that you don't approach the cars that are unloading dogs and that you don't approach other, like other volunteers that are helping with the intake process, especially, especially at the large intakes. Um, it's, it's really important for us to be able to be moving quickly and to be able to be efficient in the process and to be safe in the experiences that we're having with moving these dogs through the intake process. So just being respectful of that is really important. Um, you can certainly make your vet appointments after the dog has been picked up from intake. It's important for you to know roughly what your, um, what dog you're getting, um, breed, name, vaccination history, that kind of thing for when you make appointments. And currently we're making appointments for um, within our in-house at Invergrove Heights Animal Hospital in Invergrove Heights. And then also at Countryside Veterinary Clinic in New Richmond. And then also like always, just let your FM know if you have any questions. Um, you'll wanna check email periodically on intake day as well, because like I said, those those ETAs can update, can change kind of throughout the day. So you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on your email as there will be updates shared as they become available. And so that's something that you'll need to know as well. And then transport safety. Like I said earlier, you're going to want to make sure that you're staying, um, that you're staying in your vehicle. Do not bring your own personal dogs to intake. Please, please, please don't do that. Um, we always require that they have some sort of tether or crate when you're transporting the dog. So if that means like no loose dogs in your vehicle. So if you need to put a crate in there, let us know, we can get a crate for you or bring your own. Um, and then you can also tether in the car. I have like a tether that I can clip into my seatbelt or that I can clip onto like a hook in the, in the back and then I can connect it to the collar. That works great too. Always use a window lock, um, like a child safety lock on the windows because too often dogs can roll down the windows and try to escape and it's no good for anybody. And then um, also, like I said, doing that double loop system, the um, 
the two points of contact is important. Um, and then whenever possible, making sure that we don't have the dogs touch the ground is important. You'll see in that picture that they're carrying the dog. We can help you do that, um, especially in our parking lots, maybe not so much at home. Um, it is safer for trans transferring a dog from your car to the home to not have it on the ground, um, just because there's a less risk of it getting away obviously um, but if that's something that you need to do because you don't have as many hands at home as we do at intake that's fine but at intake we really um, try to strive to not have dogs touch the ground if at all possible so um kind of the lifestyle of a dog in your home um i already said dragging a leash when at home utilizing pens um, making sure that your collars are fitted properly um, and then making sure that all dogs and other animals and um, children are in the loop about what's going on and making sure that we're safe in that process. So um, this is the event that's happening this weekend. So um, we're doing one on Saturday and Sunday for the North Dakota Surrender event. We are expecting over 300 dogs um, from this event. Last year we um, welcomed over 200 um, and this year we're expecting significantly more. There will be a variety of ages, breeds, sizes. Um, we will take requests on certain categories. Um, we just obviously the more open that you can be the better it is for us and the better it is for all the other fosters who have you know, legitimate needs. Some dogs in their homes, our resident dogs, are reactive to men, like male dogs. Um, sometimes they're re, they don't get along with small dogs or whatever it might be. Um, and so those are some things that we want to be mindful of. So the, and just obviously we don't know what's coming. So it's not like we can say to North Dakota, oh, hey, by the way, we need one foster for this, one foster for that. So you want to be careful about how much um, you're kind of limiting yourself and limiting the rescue. Um, because the more open we can be, the better, and the more we can save. Um, let's see here. We will not know too much about the dogs before they arrive to rescue, unfortunately. That happens often. Usually it's just the shelter environments that we really have much of any information about. Um, there probably won't be any photos. We probably won't know ages or health history or anything like that. It is truly a come as you are, we will help the dog kind of event. And so we have no idea what we're getting. We are likely getting litters and um, pregnant dogs maybe even too. So if that's something, those are unique foster experiences. And so if that's something that you're capable of doing, please let us know as soon as possible. Um, and we would be happy to help you. Um, it will be taking place at Angel's Pet World. Please wait in your car. We'll have supplies there. And also please with events of this magnitude, we need you to be patient at intake. There are so many dogs, so many volunteers, and so many facets that are involved with an intake like this. And it's something that we truly, honestly, I don't think have ever done. I mean, we've done a large event last year of similar size, but not to this complete magnitude. So please be patient as we um, process through dogs. So a little bit about the medical and behavior questions. So. Uh, let's see here. We are, like I said, dedicated to high veterinary um, care in rescue. And so we have high veterinary care bills. And so that's something that we know and that that's why um, we really rely on donations in order for us to be able to provide that type of care to our dogs. Um, but that's just something that we want to make sure that we know. Um, there are certain things. Um, worms are honestly kind kind of a, a given or a guarantee and it's something that you need to be really all that concerned about you just need to be proactive about it um we try to get them on dewormer as soon as possible to kind of um you know kind of get it through their system we want to make sure that um while they're you know being dewormed and things like that that we're being careful about you know picking up their stool right away things like that um and then also a little bit about mange. Um, this isn't terribly common, but it is, it is something that we run into relatively often. And so it's something that we like to talk about. Um, there's two different types of mange. Um, there's sarcoptic mange, um, which is contagious to other dogs and humans. This is more uncommon, is what I've seen, is that it's less common than like Demodex mange. 
demon dex mange is not contagious um it's just something that they um you know, everybody has mites in their body and it just depends on their immune system and how they're able to fight it. And so um, sometimes it will kind of be shown um, <clears throat> in that way. Um, and mange is just, um, usually they're itchy and sometimes they have hair loss or scabbing. Um, so that's just something to be um, careful of. But sometimes I've had dogs that I thought had mange and they didn't, they just had skin allergies or they just, um, had his back, one, one of my puppies had a bacterial skin infection, not contagious to anybody else, but just had a bacteria infection on the skin. We were able to clear it up with an antibiotic. No big deal. Um, but either way, we um, want to make sure that we're taking care of that. So please let us know. Um, kennel cough is another one. Um, it's also called Bordetella. That is a vaccination that they will be receiving um, as part of our normal protocol. And um, it really, I haven't seen it in a while. It's not terribly common, but it is something that we want to make sure that we're mindful of. If you have a foster dog that starts to kind of do a raspy cough, that's something that you'll want to talk to the vet about as well. <coughs> Here I go. I promise I don't have kennels. <laughs> um, and then ringworm is, um, it'll show up as kind of um, like blotches on the skin of the dog. Um, again, I had another dog that I thought had ringworm. It wasn't ringworm. And so try really hard not to panic and pet MD your way through any of these symptoms because trust me, I've been there. Um, but all it does is, um, make you nervous for what sometimes is no reason. So just paying attention to that. And then fleas is something that, um, we see more often in the summertime. Um, but it, is something that we've seen a little bit more recently, at least in my home. Um, but then we give them a flea and tick preventative and vacuum the house and wash the bedding. That's it. <laughs> so um, I was, I, the last time I had, the first time I had fleas, I should say, I was all paranoid about what that meant. I didn't know much about it. Um, and then I took care of it. I was completely fine. I didn't even notice it. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. But um, we are very prone to uh, making sure that the dogs and puppies do not have any event exposure um, or exposure uh, or for puppies especially um, until they've had their second round of distemper parvo vaccination and they're not allowed on public floors. So they're obviously allowed on your floors in your home um, but that they aren't allowed on public floors because we want to make sure they were keeping them as safe as possible. And then common behavioral conditions or concerns. Um, um, behavioral concerns aren't like black and white. So be open-minded. Um, also sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to adjust um, and that they need just a little bit of time and routine to be able to understand, okay, these are the boundaries that are in place. This is what the rules are. Um, that's especially true for crate issues. Sometimes I'll have a dog that, like right now, I have a dog in a crate. Actually, I actually have four dogs in a crate because I wanted them to be quiet and leave me alone while I was doing this video. Um, but one of the dogs that I have in the crate um, wasn't crate trained when I got her. She was <laughs> very loud um, and would be for a while. And now um, she's in her crate and she's completely fine. You just have to really... So what I do when I need to do that is I put them in the crate and then I leave to go to Target and I let them cry. And I don't have to hear it and then they get used to it and they know that I'm not gonna let them out. Um, the important thing with crate training is to um, be consistent and to kind of hold your ground on it. Um, and so again, any of these um, behavioral issues, if you have questions about them, contact your FM and they can help you too. Um, dog reactivity, if you're seeing any dog reactivity, um, especially in the first 24, 48 hours, be patient and be careful. Um, leashing, crating, doing what you need to to do slow introductions if there's any reactivity is important. And, um, and then if you continue to see problems, then please reach out to um, the foster at email and then also your foster mentor. Resource guarding um, can be somewhat common. It's not terribly common, but it can be common. Um, and this is with food, toys, people, and other spaces. Most commonly food and toys being um, the two that I see most often in my home. The, 
with food, um, I always feed my dogs separate. <clears throat> I feed my litters together because um, they're a litter, so I feed them together. But otherwise, I don't have open food sources for dogs when they're around. When I feed them, they all go to their crates, and I, I feed them in their crate. That's another way to help with crate training giving them some type of reward, especially if they're food motivated, by having them eat their food in their crate is important. The other thing is, is there are dogs who, um, that's all they've known is eating in their crate. And so that's something that you'll want to keep in mind too. Um, and then with toys, I don't let any toys down for the first couple of days. I see how they interact with each other. I let them kind of, um, figure out their boundaries with each other a little bit. And then I kind of slowly introduce, you know, a couple of toys um, and then monitor the situation, um, maybe use a leash if necessary. Again, contact your FM if you have any questions about these. All right. Again, scheduling feedings, no free feedings is important. Doing that two times a day. Um, once in the morning and once in the evening is usually what is recommended. Sometimes a veterinary um, person will recommend a couple of times a day, um, but that's very few and far between cases. And then crate and kennel training is really important for a number of reasons, but the primary reason is because your job is to foster them to adoption not to have them for the boundaries that you have set up. Um, we really want to make sure that the adopters, um, if there is an adopter that wants to crate their dog when they're gone for the day, that they're able to do that and that we start that process right from the beginning of rescue. Um, and um, and the same with being on furniture, on beds or things like that, like trying to make sure that you're um, setting up a dog for as many good behaviors as possible so that if an adapter wants to loosen those boundaries, then that's up to them. But if they don't want to do that, that's fine too. Um, um, so bones and toys, um, we avoid rawhide elk antlers and like actual bones um, in rescue altogether. Um, rawhide, especially this time of year, um, it's really, really important for you to not um, allow your dogs to have that. Um, and then um, you can use Nyla bones though, something that is um, like a Benna bone or a Nyla bone, something like that, that's intended for dog um, use is, is fine. It's the other things that aren't where they can break off and shatter and then cause an, um, digestive problems is where we have the issues. And then using those alternatives um, and peanut butter filled Kongs are great too. Um, if you need some of those toys, um, certainly let us know. Um, and then obviously monitor all toys for escalation and then also for destruction of it. Um, especially, um, we don't recommend stuffy toys, but some dogs I can trust to have the stuffy toys and that they like it, especially my moms. Um, they really like snuggling with them. And so oftentimes I'll use that, but I, I monitor it when they have it. Um, and then should you let your dog sleep in bed with you? It's up to you, but obviously um, we recommend that you don't just because we want to make sure that it's, that if the adopter doesn't want the dog to sleep in the bed, that they don't, it doesn't pose for a problem after adoption. Um, we do, um, that there is, there is liability for dog parks. Um, and so we do not recommend, um, nor do we, um, do we cover any veterinary care that happens from taking a foster dog to a dog park? Um, we pretty much just say, don't do it. <laughs> um, so please just try not to do it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and I'm out of butter. <laughs> um, and then using a, completely avoiding retractable leashes is really helpful too. You can't really control the dog in that and like with that type of leash especially with larger dogs. And so we really ask that you don't use them. Um, Facebook, um, use, utilizing Facebook to um, search for fosters is great, but utilizing it as a way to say that you're committing to a foster is not. <laughs> so you can certainly comment and say, I'm interested, I'm, you know, whatever, but you can, the best thing to do is say, sending an email and then send that email. Um, email is the way that, you know, the foster coordinator will keep track of all of that. And so it's important for us to be able to do that. 
And then it's also important for you to read all documents and emails that come from the rescue so that you're in the loop about any processes and procedures that have changed. Um, there are many different event opportunities. Um, there should be an event monthly email that comes out to you so that you can um, be in the loop about what's going on. And then also in the foster portal, there's going to be an event calendar that uh, you can utilize for that. Um, they must meet their 10 day holds. They must be in rescue for 10 days, be fully vaccinated, be fully vaccinated, um, vetted, and then also be altered. So spayed and neutered before they attend any event. Um, adoption events. Um, can be, are usually um, at Angel's Pet World. There's also showcases at Pet Evolution and Angel's. Um, check for that. Um, and exposure really helps with getting um, adopters. I think that sometimes people don't believe that a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. showcase really helps, but it does. I've gotten at least three recently, and most of the time my dogs aren't aren't in my care past the 10 day hold, honestly, because I usually have them until they're spayed and neutered and they get posted at six weeks and then I keep them and then I have three weeks to find adopters for them before they're ready for events. So, um, but every dog that I've taken, I think, has found an adopter around the same time that I've brought them, so. All right, and so then foster failing. So what is foster failing? So it just means that you want to adopt the foster that you have in your home, um, which is okay. Um, we ask that you keep fostering, even if you do foster fail, um, but that's okay if you do. Um, you must follow the same adoption process as any other foster, or as any other adopter, um, and you do not have um, any, like, special treatment, basically. So once the dog is posted on the website, it's free game for anybody. Um, they get posted on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, typically. And so it's important for you to kind of just be checking the website if you're interested in that. And then you must be prepared to adopt the dog when it's available. Um, fosters don't get first dibs. You don't get like a discount or anything like that. Um, and that we do truly give a, you know, a first come first serve kind of thing to anyone that applies. And so um, your foster mentor will help you with that process if you have questions though. All right, and then making sure that you follow all processes and procedures is really important. Copying um, on all of your emails, your FM as the primary point of contact. So even if you need to email about an adoption um, where you would normally include Johanna, you'll also wanna include your foster mentor as well. Um, replying all to emails is incredibly important. Please do not just reply to an email, reply all to the email, um, unless if it says otherwise, which we really never do that um, because it's important for everyone to be in the loop on what's going on. Um, keep the Facebook post and comments positive, um, even on the main page, because there are some times that um, like our followers will want to, you know, had maybe have surrendered a dog and they were like seeing the dog just keep it as positive as possible and then mail the adoption paperwork next day or drop it off at angel's pet world um we always have about you know a tough time sometimes but um it's really important for us to be on top of that so that we can process them effectively um the adoption process you will go through with your foster mentor at least two times i think is what that is Yes, two. Um, first home visit and two adoptions for training. So if you get an adopter, um, you're going to want to make sure that your um, foster mentor is there for you for the first home visit um, oh, and then for the first two adoptions as well. And then you can make um, a vet appointment as soon as you know that you'll be welcoming that dog and you pick it up from intake. All right, this is normally where we would do the questions and answers. Um, if you have questions, please let somebody know, your foster mentor or the foster at email address. Um, this weekend especially, I think that it would be ideal for you to just email your foster mentor. They're probably going to be more responsive right now, but then copying Sarah on that email is helpful um, just so that she can be in the loop and answer if she has it. But everybody on staff is really, really busy this week, and so um, just want to make sure that we're being mindful of that. That is pretty much it. So I really appreciate you all 
um, being here and sharing this experience with us. We're really, really excited to have you on board. We really hope that you're able to help this weekend. And if you can, please let somebody know. And especially just a little shout out if you can do a litter. That is great. Um, you maybe saw my little puppies over there <laughs> on the little dog bed the, the mom was nursing earlier. But anyway, so it is doable. And yeah, if you have questions, let us know. Thank you so much.